So let me start the second part of my talk. So title of second talk is the black curve counter at low and intermediate energy. What is a low and intermediate? It depends on the person. In my world, as a, our research institute, the high energy accelerator, for example, so the high energy people say that, okay, so one MEB, that's a extremely low, 100 MEB, that's a low, well, that depends on the person. So that's a low means the above 2 MEB at this moment, and then the intermediate is up to the less than 1 GB. So the, this is the, also the ionization chamber, but it's a application for the high energy side. That's because uh, we want to measure the much it's a high energy incident particle cross section, so we need to develop another detector system. So the, at this moment, the target should be measured, and the target reaction is the fragment production. What is a fragment? Fragment is a much heavier particle than alpha. So the high energy particle, so the open the several channels, reaction channels. So the exceed the 20 MeV or exceed 30 MeV or at least 100 MeV. So that case, that we have so many secondary particles, not only neutron, proton, deuteron, triton, alpha, also the lithium, beryllium, boron, and carbon. That kind of relatively heavy particle we call fragment. So to measure the fragment, we need some special detector. That's because we need to analyze, or we need to identify the what particle it is. So this is the tool to identify the particle type. This is a black cup counter. So at first, I'd like to explain why do we need to me measure the charged particle production reaction in 100 or tens of MeV projectiles. And uh, I would like to explain how to measure the charged particles. So at this moment, uh, for high energy, there's a no appropriate source for neutron anymore. We don't have any monoenergetic neutron source at the beyond high 100 MeV. We only have the cross monoenergetic. And also the production rate of target reaction is very low. So that case, uh, we use the proton beam instead of neutron. That is a difference. So first, I want to talk about the overview of cross-section data libraries. So here is the energy scale from electron volt to tera electron volt. So just the image, actually. So the nuclear engineering start from electron volt. So the mainly uh, application, main application is the fission reactor. Then we start the research about the fast breeder reactor. So we need the cross section of KEV region. So as I mentioned you in today morning, uh, so the fusion reactor study also starts. We need the cross section up to 40 MeV. So we prepare the data library up to 20 MeV. That's a neutral cross section. But from the accelerator side, so we have already developed so many high energy accelerator leads to GEB or cosmic ray or terrestrial <coughs> the radiation uh, leads to TEB. So that's a really high energy. So the case, the interaction is different. And also the product is different. The most of concern is the reaction product in this energy range. So what reaction product we're going to have. And also the design, the accelerator, we need neutron transport. That's because the neutron generated and down to the EB. So anyway, it's a different kind of data library we need. That's because in low energy case, the reaction is the nucleus and nucleon, which means the neutron induced in nucleus, and then it's a two-body reaction that mainly occurs, and the scattering or absorption, fission, decay, 
Sometimes it's a three body, but it's a few body. But for high, high energy case, we have so many products, that's because the nucleus is totally dis destroyed and then uh, produce the several, it's a proton, the neutron, or either, or a fragment. So the, it's a difficult to describe in uh, its a current library, so that we use the reaction model and we take the data to verify the reaction model itself. So this is the schematic view drawing. So what we our concern is the we have the, some of the application for energy region. One is the therapy machine, there's a tumor therapy, where we need to estimate the it's a device error which is called the single event effect, where we need the data for nuclear synthesis calculation. Uh, the famous uh, accelerator-driven system design. And also, this is the my field, that's a radiation safety design or accelerator. We need to see the radiation from the accelerator, so we need some of the data for the cross-section and also attenuation and transportation, etc. So what kind of reaction we have to take into account is the neutron nuclear incident, and then we have the reaction. There are several models. One is the internuclear cascade, which is the collision inside the nucleus. Well, this is the evaporation that is a, that's a, should be familiar for the low energy case, that's a, just evaporate. And then it's a coalescence means the one of the nucleon uh, going out uh, with the sum of the nucleon. That's a, it makes it a alpha or it's a neutron or whatever. And then it's a cluster emission or this kind of model we develop. Then the ejector, if the ejector is neutron, so neutron is a very important for sailing design and also the, as I told you, that's energy propagation calculation we need, neutron spectrum and also the intensity. For the charged particle, is a different. That's because it's the charged particle easy to see. That's because the electromagnetic force stop the charged particle. So the charged particle easily stop. But in other words, the old charged particle energy deposit in locally the stopped medium. So let's let us think about, uh, for example, so the silicon device. So the silicon device is very small and then irradiated by neutron. So the neutron produces a charged particle. That's the energy is a charged particle. And then the energy totally deposits in, within the device. So what happens is the information held by the device is changed or leaked or disappear. Or in that case, we have some of the error of the device. Or ourselves, the human. I mean, it's a, so the, for the tumor therapy, the ion beam injects to the human body. So we need to explain how much energy deposit and how much secondary produce, and then uh, how much effect we're going to have. That kind of calculation, we need some data. But not only data, also that uh, model is very important. That's because that we cannot take all the data, the part of the data, and then verify the model, and then do the calculation by using the model. So actually, we need the neutron data, that's because the neutron is in everywhere, for example. And this is the, one of the examples for the, our the, a machine. This is a 3 GB proton accelerator housing, and then it's uh, produce a neutron. So how much neutron we're going to have is 30% uh, is high energy. That's a 20 to 100 MeV. And here is a karma factor, for example, and the energy is a 0 to 80. And then it's a uh, total is here. And most of it due to the alpha. So the alpha production is uh, very important. And also, the, we, you can see here is the red line is the other. And also the elastic, elastic component. So we need to estimate the cross-section and also the energy of secondary particle to estimate how much energy deposit locally by neutron. Actually, neutron itself has no impact, just pass through. But once neutron makes some of the reaction, and then huge energy deposition occurred locally. This is the 
example of the single event upset. So as I told you, that's a, here is a silicon device. So neutron comes in and make a, some of the reaction, and then that's a convert to the charged particle. So his energy deposit totally in this device. So this is the spectrum. Uh, here is the energy, that's the log scale, and uh, this is the flux. And here is a C level neutron flux, so you can see the high energy <laughs> component. So these components can make some of the fragmentation and produce a charged particle that affect that devices. And of course, in space, that's a much severe condition. That's because the charged particle, energy charged particle, irradiates the spaceship and then make a neutron was charged particle itself produce such kind of heavy fragment and affect the device. So this is rough, the plot of data situation. So up to 20 MeV, we already do the plenty of effort to prepare <coughs> the data set for the application. It's a fusion reactor and also the fast breeder reactor and the fission detector. So we need the neutron cross section as well as we prepare the proton, neutron, triton, and alpha production. So the several data is available up to the 20 MeV. And for proton, uh, to, uh, down to uh, up to 20 MeV, the data is partially available, but not so totally. And then it's uh, above the 20 MeV, so up to 1 GeV. So uh, we have the, some of the data on neutron. Uh, I talk about uh, roughly in here. And also that's a uh, heavy ion, uh, I mean fragment uh, production is a very few data. And uh, so that uh, the source problem, uh, we also t try to take the proton data, and some of the data is available, already available, but uh, focus on the fragment, that's few data. So we need to develop the detector system. Of course, we also need the extremely high energy data, but the flux density is not so high. So at this moment, we don't need us, actually. So the target region is uh, around 100 MeV. That's for the high neutron flux, relatively high neutron flux. And also, that's, uh, we use the energy for therapy. That's a problem. So anyway, uh, we need to prepare the data. To prepare the data, so we need some machine. So uh, several, this one is uh, only in Japan, but uh, several machines are available in worldwide so that we can cover the energy for the ABF cyclotron or there's a ring cyclotron uh, for up to 400 MeV. So we can use that kind of machine. So neutron versus proton, that's neutron incidence versus proton. So that's a comparison between what happened, uh, what, what difference we can have. So neutron, the neutron produced as a secondary particle, you know. So the intensity is relatively low. That's because secondary. And uh, it's uh, really difficult, impossible to focus. That's because of uncharged, just collimated. Well, difficult to count precisely. Yeah, that's uh, because of the uh, interaction is limited. And also, it has the background. Well, it's, uh, in high energy region, we don't have any monoenergetic source. Only the, we have the cross monoenergetic source. That's a problem for the 100 MeV, around the 100 MeV region. In contrast, the proton, proton, you know, that's a charged particle, so we can accelerate directly. That's easy to accelerate, easy to focus, uh, easy to available high intensity. And we can count precisely by using the counter or even the Faraday cup. That's a no feature of the neutron case. And the background is really small and it's a monoenergetic. That's because we can select by using the magnet system and uh, so the proton beam is available. So uh, our strategy for the intermediate energy reaction cross-section data, uh, the measure the cross-section using a proton to evaluate the reaction model, then apply to, uh, then apply to neutron. That's uh, our strategy. So that's uh, we move to the proton experiment, reason the proton experiment. So how do we measure the fragment so there are three typical methods. So one is the already explained the D delta E E. That's the D E E method. So the fragment comes in this direction, 
and then the thing at a transparent detector, and then it's a stop detector, the combination to detect a system, so we know the total energy and energy loss. So the energy loss, from the energy loss, we can determine the particle admit number, and then it's a uh, energy resolution is uh, relatively high, that's because it's, uh, we can use the nice scintillator. So this is the one of the method to measure the fragment. The other is the time of flight. So the fragment uh, passed through the very thin, the Toria detector, and this is start signal, so we measure the energy and also the time of flight. So we can check the relationship between energy and the time of flight, and we can determine their mass, not Z. Of course, we can combine, combine the, these two methods. So the ETOF is the energy time of flight with the delta EE, so we can determine the, both of the, these parameters. The problem is that the delta EE, the, we have the transmission detector, but this should be very thin. That's because of the, now the, our particle should be measured. It's, relatively high energy loss this because lithium or beryllium or boron, that's a heavy particle, so that we need to prepare much thin detector, right? Otherwise, the, most of the fragments stop in here and we can't measure anything. About that. For the energy time of fry, that's also have difficult, that's because we have the certain time of fry pass, which means the solid angle of the energy detector becomes small. So the counter uh, problem we're going to have. So the black curve counter, that is uh, another way to measure the fragment. So the, this detector itself determines the fragment energy and also the G number. Uh, that's because the, here is the cathode, and here is the re entrance window. And this is anode, and again, it's a grid. So actually, this one is a grid is ion edge chamber, but the length is much longer. Then the fragment coming in from this direction, so the energy loss distribution is like this. That's a black curve, you know. And this signal, uh, if we check, uh, read the anode signal, so the time distribution of anode signal have this shape. So later I will explain the detail. But then you, how can you do that is the total integration is correspond to the energy. And height of this peak is correspond to the G number of fragment. So combination of two parameters, we know the energy and Z number of fragment. Here is the energy loss of fragment. At this moment, so for example, so it's a proton and alpha and lithium, barium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. And here is the range, uh, the energy uh, the, of the particles. So 0 to 20 MeV, for example. And the vertical axis corresponds to the range, range of in silicon. So the normally, uh, typically we use the for example, the delta E detector, we use the silicon detector. So the, how much silicon detector we're going to have, it's, uh, for example, it's uh, 10 micrometer silicon or 11 micrometer silicon. So that case, the, of course, the proton is no problem. It's, uh, even the one we proton can pass through the silicon detector and make signal for E detector, so we can measure the proton easily. But for lithium, for example, that's a 5 mEV lithium can stop. Uh, within the 10 micrometer silicon. So we cannot measure the less than 5 MeV lithium by using the delta EE system. Or it's a carbon, it's a 12 or 11 MeV. There's a range uh, to the 10 micrometer thickness silicon. So we can't measure the 10, less than 10 MeV carbon. So we need much thinner window or thinner delta e detector at this moment. So the black curve, maybe everyone knows that uh, here is a range, and this is the energy loss, the DDX. So this one is helium curve, 
and lithium carb, and barium, and boron carbon, so the height depending on their charge. So we can distinguish the, if we can extract the peak value, so we can determine the type of particles. So this is the black carb uh, plot, so that this is the energy, and this is the black peak, so that's uh, not regarding the energy, we can determine the particle type easily by checking the black peak height. So, how to do that? It's not difficult. We just uh, prepare the ionization chamber. And then it's a cathode, an anode, and grid. Then we have the thin window in, on the cathode plate, and then there's a heavy ion injected in this direction. The ones that stop the high, heavy ion, and then a, this one is the charge distribution. Then we have the electric field, so the, this electron moves to the anode. So as I mentioned to you, that's a grid is a totally it's a separate the ionization chamber to two, two parts, and then the only checking the this part. So the first, uh, this is the time, and this is the signal. So that's the first part beyond the grid, so that makes some signal, and then the next part uh, beyond the grid, and then makes signal, and then that's a, the time distribution of signal is just opposite of this shape. So we keep pick up the, this part uh, by using the short time constant amplifier, and then determine the Z value, and then uh, use the long time constant amplifier to determine the total value. And then uh, we know the E and Z. So this is the schematic view diagram of the how signal produced. So just as a move, it's a, this is the time. So they're just moving the electron distribution. And then that's once the beyond the grid. So we have the, some signal. And then it's a, this part. And then finally this part. And so we can check the first part uh, to obtain the blood peak. That's a very simple. So this is actual installation of black cow counter. So we use the grid cathode, and here is anode, and this is a grid. So just before the anode, we insert the grid. The total length is 30 centimeters. That's uh, much longer than before, so which means the electric field is distorted. That's because of the ground level. So we need to prepare the sum of the gathering to uh, form the uniform electric field. So we apply the high voltage, and then it's, uh, here is the resistor chain. Uh, so the gradually it, uh, drop the high voltage and make the field uniform field. And then that's, uh, we have the entrance into here. Uh, typically, we use the 2.5 micrometer aluminum mira, but recently we use the less than micrometer thickness, the silicon nitride uh, window, and then the fragment can pass through and enter in this section. At this moment, uh, we use the argon ten plus 10% uh, the CH4 uh, gas. Uh, for as a counting gas, that because the, this one is not neutron measurement, that's a proton measurement, so there's no neutron around here, there's no background, actually. And then that's, uh, the point is this one, this pressure. As I told you, that we can adjust the thickness of the detector itself so that we can set the require the pressure to stop the fragment. This is in this case the 200. That's uh, actually negative pressure. And then it's a uh, for the operation makes easy. So the counter was operated under the gas flow mode. So the low pressure gas flow, and every time we deplace the gas to maintain the quality of gas. Okay. So this is the picture. The, the field shaping ring, and this is uh, this one is the biggest one, so that uh, looks very large. But uh, we also have the small one. 
So the shape is cylindrical, and then the, the, this side we have the entrance window. So that this side is connected to the scattering chamber and uh, comes from fragment. Fragment comes from. And here is the picture of entrance window. Uh, one of the example is a silicon nitride as a window. Uh, that's a very thin. That's a less than one micrometer. Uh, this one is uh, already commercially available, so we used that one. Then that's uh, the here is a membrane. That's a 0.5 micrometer, but the size is uh, you can see it's a 23. That's a 2.3 centimeter square, but it's uh, we need to. We need some of the support structure. So here is the support structure to uh, avoid the breakdown in the window, window part, it's the membrane part. That's the commercial available, so we use that one. So let's talk about the experiment. So several accelerators, it's uh, actually two accelerators we use. The normal, it's uh, AVX cyclotron we use to the 40 MeV proton to 80 MeV proton experiment. And then the, the ring cyclotron uh, for the 140 to 300 MeV. This is the setup for ring cyclotron. So you can see it uh, here, it's a scattering chamber, and uh, it's a center of scattering chamber. We have the sample, it's a target, and then one, two, three, four, five is a black curve counter to measure the fragment. Okay, this, so this is the plan view of experimental setup. So the beam comes from this direction and then go to the beam dump. Right? And then it's, uh, here is the scattering chamber. So at the center of the scattering chamber, we put the target radar. And then it's, uh, we put, set the sample targets for the carbon, aluminum, and aluminum oxide, aluminum nitrogen, titanium, copper, and tantal. <coughs> Uh, because the, our, what we want to measure is the one is the carbon, that's a standard, and the aluminum, that's a very close to the silicon, so that we can estimate the fragment production silicon by using the aluminum data. And this one is the, for the data for oxygen, so that we need to subtract aluminum effect by using the aluminum data and then deduce oxygen data. And the same as for nitrogen. So the, these three is a very important atom for that because it's an organic, that the human body consists of the kind of atoms. And then it's a titanium and copper. The copper, we have the, some data, so the comparison we use that one is. So the black curve counter we put in, in this figure, maybe three, yes, three or four. And this is a typical view, beam spot. Uh, it's really nice. That's, uh, that's because we have the quadrupole, poles, so that we strong focusing the available. So that's a uh, one millimeter approximately diameter spot on the target, and then they produce a fragment. Okay, so this is the list of the targets. So the graphite and aluminum. That's an uh, order of one micrometer. Only the, this one is uh, ten micrometer. That's uh, because it's. Uh, not some target. That's uh, actually the backing for the aluminum oxide, aluminum nitrogen. So we use the sputtering technique and then the comparable thickness uh, aluminum oxide or aluminum nitrogen layer on the tantal 10 micrometer as a backing for and then do the experiment. So we need to do the background run for tantal, tantal run to subtract effect. Of course, yeah, we have to do that. This is the electronics. It's not special. Again, that's just to pick up the signal from cathode. Actually, we don't need this one, but uh, we have the special application for cathode, so we process the cathode signal. And then this one is uh, from the anode. So again, that's a preamplifier, and amplifier, and ADC. That's a standard electronics. But we also need additional amplifier. That's because we also need short time constant data. That's for the black peak. So just simply add well, additional amplifier. That's a delay line amplifier. That's a short, very short time constant. 
uh, which corresponds to 0 0.2 microsecond or something like that. And this one is uh, 10 microsecond. That's a totally different shaping time. And then the two data uh, as measured by, uh, uh, digitized by ADC, and then the list data taken as processed. So the other is the rate I will explain. We're going to measure the time difference between the cathode and anode signal, which correspond to the range of fragment. That is also useful to the identify the fragment type. So we process the preamplifier signal to the time in fifth amp and then CFD, and then take the time difference between two signals. That will be helpful to determine the fragment type. So this is the one of the example of the black peak it's a actual data. So here is the energy, and this axis corresponds to the black peak height. So the energy of proton is 80 MeV, and the sample is carbon, targeted carbon. So we don't, we don't have any of the fragment more than carbon. So that's uh, from helium, resin, the beryllium, the boron, and the carbon. So we don't have any proton hydrogenous the secondary particle. That's because of the, our detector has the pressure of our detector is very low. So which means the proton easily pass through and deposit very small amount of energy. So we easily to cut off the proton. Actually, that's, uh, we have so many protons in this region, but the energy position is very small, so we, we can discriminate the effect. So the, we can identify the particle type uh, like this. That's a uh, rock peak height is defined uh, according to the, their charge, the helium, lithium, and boron, and boron carbon. But it's not sufficient at this moment. That's because in this energy range, for example, 80 MeV, the produced fragment energy is like a 10 MeV or 5 MeV or 15 or 20. Or that's not so high, but not so low. Then the sum of the fragment passing through the black curve counter itself. And then that is a, this event is correspond to the, it's a punch out, we call the punch out fragment. That's because it's a, that should be go straight, but we don't have enough length of detector or enough thickness of detector, so the energy loss is limited, so the, this component going, going down uh, because of the passing through. And the other is the here. That's because it's, uh, we say it's, uh, we can, I say that uh, we can determine the fragment type because of black peak height, but too low energy the fragment cannot form the black peak. So before the black peak, so the particles stop, that kind of event. So that kind of event we can separate by using the time difference method. So later I will explain the, the time difference between the cathode and anode, so the signal uh, correspond to the range. So the, at this moment, the, these particles doesn't have rock peak, but still have the dependency of range. So the energy and the range relationship tell us uh, some of the identification. And this part, this part is much easier. That's because uh, we know the particle type. This one is resin, right? So the, we know the deposit energy, so that we can estimate <coughs> the energy should be deposited uh, from the deposit energy, so that we can compensate the missing energy by using calculation. So these are very important to extend the measurable energy range in this energy application. Okay, here, how can we do that? Is the castle, an anode, and here is the grid. So this is a fragment. So this is the low signal uh, from this uh, black cup counter. This one is the anode, and this one is a cathode. So you can see that there is a time difference which corresponds to distance from here to here. So we can determine the time difference by using the timing filter amp signal, it's a CFD signal, and then it's a relatively length of this uh, the trajectory, and then that's, uh, we 
binary we have the kind of this is the energy and this is the particle range and uh, it's a much better separation for low energy part uh, that's because of the time difference still we have uh, the, the range uh, difference uh, based because of the fragment z charge so you can see this uh, helium and helium 3 component and lithium 6 and 7 and barium 7 and 9 and boron and carbon so we can so in ordinary way we may have the, these black point data only that's because of the this one is correspond to the this one is correspond to the flat part right but uh, that one is absolutely not enough data. So we need to extend the lower side and the higher side. For lower side, uh, with particular identification by using this technique and then increase the part, right? For well, let's say this one is the lithium and barium case and the carbon, the boron, boron carbon is much more. And then the higher energy side, this part, it's the deduced from the energy compensation offline analysis for this part. Then we have the enough dynamic range by using one detector. Data analysis, that's not special. So just as a number of protons, we can measure the proton fluence easily by using the Faraday cup. That's a very big difference between neutron and proton, right? <laughs> and also that's a number of the atom in the tank, that's the same thing, right? And the energy calibration, we can use the amelium alpha check source, and also that's a punch through particle and gas pressure relationship, which means the here. So that we know the gas pressure. We know the it's a range and the maximum deposit energy. So that that point also can use for the energy calibration. Of us. And then it's uh, energy loss in the target and the window. We need to compensate by using the energy loss data and through the angle that we can calculate the by using the analytical equation or let's uh, just put the emission particle at this uh, uh, target position and then count how many alpha we're going to have. That's uh, we can estimate a certain angle. So this is the, one of the results. Uh, it's, uh, here is the energy, and uh, this one is the tar target is uh, carbon, and uh, here is the lithium production at 30 degree, and then that's uh, what is the difference in the energy? So the 40 MeV proton, uh, 50 MeV proton, and 70 MeV proton, and the 80 MeV proton, the spectrum could be shifted for high energy region. For lithium, we have the energy range uh, from the 5 MeV to 35 MeV. Unfortunately, that's not enough for the 80 MeV, so we need some of the additional detector for 80 MeV case. But it's uh, 50 and 70 is almost enough. So you can see the, some of the interesting structure you have. You can see that this, this peak. That's the lithium production. We at low energy, I mean it's a low, low means a 50 or 40, that's a close to this threshold, that's some of the two-body reaction and the form the sum of the peak. It's a really interesting. But for high ener higher energy, the peak is disappear and then it's a uh, continuous distribution we're going to have. So this is a cross-check, one of the cross-check. That's the purpose of the cross-check, but uh, that is a basic idea to what can we obtain by using the recoil uh, counter-telescope. That's not different than the uh, uh, black curve counter. So the black curve counter can measure the, this part, right? That's, uh, that's because of the no delta E, no transmission, just the window part. So the threshold energy is very low, so we can measure this major component. By using the counter telescope, this it's a circle, so we can see the lower energy component. That's because the counter telescope need the transmission detector, and that transmission detector has finite thickness. 
So the, this case, the miss the 20 mb, less than 20 mb part, but the counter telescope has much higher stopping power, so they provide the higher energy part. So these two data is consistent for the aluminum P, aluminum target, and the proton incidence and the lithium. It's a <coughs> production uh, at this uh, 30 degree and 90 degree, and the proton energy is 200 MeV. That's quite high. So the, if you inject a proton with energy of 200 MeV, so you can imagine that's a 100 MeV lithium produced and then emitted. That's huge. And this is the beryllium case. Again, uh, the counter telescope has some of the <laughs> threshold and the black curve uh, measured. That's this, uh, it's a major part. And so the total production can obtain uh, by connecting the two data. But anyway, that's, uh, most of the yield uh, can measure by using a black curve counter. This is one of the advantage. And for boron, we don't have any more, uh, we don't have the counter telescope data anymore. That's because the stopping power of the boron is very high. So they cannot penetrate the delta E detector. So the only the black curve counter or gaseous counter provide such kind of data. So this is the just idea what happened uh, on the, the fragment production so it's, uh, what I want to say is that this is the particle energy, and this is the cross-section, and just changing the target from the carbon to gold. And then it's, uh, for carbon, uh, here is uh, proton-induced, uh, 200 MeV proton-induced, and the lithium emission at 30 degree. Some of the data is 20 degree, but 30 degree. And then it's a carbon target if you use so you can see this distribution. That's because the Coulomb barrier of carbon target is very low, so we can observe the low energy component. But uh, with increasing the target Z number, so that we, we're going to observe the Coulomb barrier effect, and then it's uh, no fragment uh, for low energy part anymore. That's a typical that's a phenomena uh, for the uh, fragment production. And also that you can see that this slope, this slope is not so much different. Uh, it's, uh, it's depending on the uh, excitation energy. Uh, that is also an uh, interesting feature of the fragment production. So the, the experimental data uh, we can, we try to describe by using the analytical function so the, it's a Coulomb barrier model, and also it's a Maxwellian distribution. And we combine the Maxwellian distribution, it's a black curve, it's combined the Coulomb barrier, and then it's, we're gonna have the red curve. That should be somehow it's a parameterized, uh, three parameterized uh, to the it's a DDX data, right? So here is the fitting example. For example, so the carbon, the, we don't have any small uh, effect of Coulomb barrier, and this is uh, silver. Uh, this is silver, so this should be gold. I'm sorry, this one should be gold. And then it's a copper, and so we have the Coulomb barrier effect, and we, we can describe by using, uh, we can parameterize uh, by using the equation. And also we check the theoretical correction result uh, by using experimental data. So one is the famous code the FITS. Uh, that's a uh, fragment this production described by the combination of two models in the internuclear cascade stage and also the evaporation. The most of the fra fragment uh, from the evaporation stage from this system, but uh, you know, what is unique is that this code can choose the models uh, internuclear cascade stage and also evaporation stage. So here is the one of the results uh, of the uh, lithium production, the carbon uh, proton induce the 40 MeV to the 300 MeV. Unfortunately, we don't have 300 MeV data at this moment, but uh, we already have. And then it's, uh, you can see that the three curve, it's a black and the red and the blue. So what you understand is uh, 
what is the difference between three is uh, just internuclear part. So internuclear part, actually they, the process that was produced, the fragment, just only the proton and neutron. But uh, that stage is very important to estimate how much fragment we're going to have. That's because it's natural that uh, too much emission of internuclear cascade process, then less nuclei, so we can't form the fragment. So uh, maybe we need to suppress the internuclear uh, cascade stage, the particle emission, and then uh, nicely uh, trace the experimental data. Anyway, so that uh, we need to know that what happened on the calculation, and we need to evaluate the calculation model, which calculation model should be used. Actually, this code is for the several places, not only that's uh, seeding analysis, and also that's, uh, even in the treatment program, they use that kind of tool. Of course, the major part is ionization, so that's, uh, we don't care about that, uh, such kind of small difference, but we do the research about the impact of secondary neutron or some of its uh, activation, or that's a gamma, or the kind of it's a evaluation. So we need uh, much precise reaction model, and the model should be evaluated by using the experimental data. One of the difficulties, this one is the whole low energy. This, uh, this one is a 40 MeV, and this one is a 50 MeV. So we have uh, some of the structure. Actually, uh, the kind of the internuclear model or something, cascade model, or uh, the kind of model comes from the high energy side. So the, they don't care about the nuclear structure. We just cried the neutrons. So that uh, we need some inform add, add some of the information of the CDR nuclei and then apply. Uh, otherwise, we cannot uh, uh, describe the kind of peak structure. That is uh, one of the findings we do the experiment. So let me talk about uh, briefly about the uh, neutron-induced reaction measurement also. We try to take the neutron data also. That's up to now the proton, but we also evaluate, try to take the neutron data and then let's uh, do the, some of the comparison. So the neutron source, this is a typical neutron source. That's the JEA that Takasaki Laboratory uh, has the neutron generator uh, they have the ABF cyclotron, and then the proton beam coming from this direction. And then they install the lithium target. The lithium target uh, is a metal, so just self-support lithium installed in vacuum chamber. And then the nuclear reaction occurs, and then neutron uh, passing through this direction. And the proton beam also passing through the target, so we need some of the magnet system to remove the proton component from the neutron. So we need to separate the proton and neutron by using this magnet. And then so much background we have, so we have that tight collimator system, and then we can use the neutron. So what is the problem is the distance from here to here. That's uh, typically it's a meter of distance. So the intensity of neutron flux is quite low. That's a problem. And also that uh, monitoring of neutron flux is a little bit difficult. That's because uh, uniformity of target is not so good. And also that uh, so we put uh, some of the fission chamber to monitoring the relatively neutron incidency. That's because, uh, of course, we can measure the neutron, but we need to put a sample to measure the cross section. So that case, we cannot measure. So the, we need some of the relative monitor, so that we choose the fission chamber on here. And also there's a beam current we use. So this is the typical energy spectrum of neutron at zero degree. So that's uh, neutron energy 75 and 65 case and 55 case. The all the neutron have that's a peak structure. These are what we need to measure, uh, so what we use for the major cross section, but we also have some of the breakup component. That's the problem. That's because it's, uh, we cannot separate the component. Uh, if we have enough flight paths, we can separate. But uh, if we don't have, so uh, it's difficult to separate. So we need to take into account the effect of this component. 
and uh, this component is typically is the same amount of the peak, so one by one is the ratio. So that will be uh, it's a problem for the uh, intermediate energy application. So at first, I will introduce uh, the typical the counter telescope experiment. Another one is done in uh, the JRE Takasaki, and also the same experiment was done in uh, and much more data produced the uh, Uppsala group and the uh, Lugana group also do that same same experiment. So what we do, <coughs> what we done is uh, it's a neutron coming from this direction. And here is a vacuum chamber, and here is a sample to measure the proton and the neutron, the triton and the alpha, so we put the counter telescope at the 25 or 45 or 65 degree. So this is a schematic drawing of counter telescope. And first, we have the Myra foil. And here is the vacuum. And then the particle coming through from this direction. And then first part is the low pressure the gas proportional counter to tag check the heavy particle. And then the next one is the very large, it's a 900 square millimeter and a 100 micrometer thick, the silicon surface body detector. And then we have the scintillator. At this moment, we use the barium fluoride scintillator. That's because the, at first, we try to do the particle identification by using the slow and fast component. <coughs> the other is the it's a timing resolution is very nice so that we try to identify the neutron energy by using the time of flight information. So anyway, that's uh, this three-stage uh, telescope we use. But actually, the honestly speaking, that's really difficult to set up this uh, a detector. That's because you see that a barium fluoride, which provides nanosecond pulse. It's very fast, 10 nanoseconds or something like that. SSD. That's a microsecond or sub-microsecond. And it's a proportional count as a microsecond. These are different timing property, and we have to do the coincidence between the two detector and the other detector. And then it's a really headache. That's because it's a, we can use the timing check uh, for the alpha particle by, you, by using the alpha particle, we can check the timing property of the gas and SSD. But uh, really difficult to use timing, check the timing uh, of the barium fluoride. That's because the alpha particle completely stopped SSD. So what we do is just do the DR beam. So it takes long time. That's because the production rate is very low. So the, how to say, the electronic analysis is, the adjustment is, uh, takes really long time. So the, I don't recommend that one is actually. So just simply the SSD and the barium fluoride is uh, much simpler to operate. So here is the particle identification spectrum between the scintillator and surface barrier detector. So you can see it's a proton event, and the deuteron event, and triton event. And here, it's a scale out, but some of the alpha we can observe. But no, actually, fragment. That's because the low production rate. So anyway, we can, deter, uh, we can pick up the proton, the neutron, the event by using this setup. And here is the time of flight. So you can see it's a, it's a work effect. But anyway, so that we can see the peak component, which correspond to the peak neutron. So only we, we only pick up the component to deduce the cross section. So this is an example of result. So yes, we have the finance threshold even in the proton. That's because of uh, several noise and also the time of flight was several difficulty. But still, even in that case, uh, we have the proton data uh, above 20 MeV. And it's a neutron, the triton, and the alpha. It's a high threshold. And the line is the LA150. That's the ENDF. So that's uh, I don't know why in here, but uh, it's a good agreement, except for this part. Anyway, so that we can measure the proton, neutron, triton for neutron incident by using the counter telescope. 
So how about fragment? Can we measure fragment for neutron? That's the one of the challenge. And a bit complicated. I don't know I can explain correctly. But what we did is the, this is the normal geometry. So here is a collimated neutron beam, and we put the target. And then we put uh, some of the, the detector system. But this one, the problem, that's because it's uh, this distance. So we lose the most of the fragment. That's because of the solid angle. So we try to do this geometry. So the neutron coming from this direction, and then the target uh, put on the cathode and uh, on beam alignment, and then the grid and the anode. So that case, the most of the fragment we can measure uh, that because it's a sample, it's a target uh, is inside of black curve counter. So this is the setup. So what we improve is that we give up the time of flight. That's because the black curve counter is a microsecond time resolution. So that we put the black curve counter as possible as close to the lithium target. And now it's a 1.3 meter. That setup is also available for the, I think Uppsala also has such kind of setup that uh, maximize the neutron flux. And then that we need to separate the neutron and the proton by using uh, the clearing magnet, this bending magnet. And then if we dump the proton somewhere here, so the plenty of neutron we're going to have, the background neutron we're going to have, and it will be a problem. So the proton guided to this direction, and then the heavy sheet beam dump we have prepare, and then it's a separate uh, less impact uh, from the background neutron. So this is the setup for fragment measurement of neutron in induced fragment cross-section measurement. Right. So, what happened on that is uh, this is the real uh, structure. So we again have the field shaping ring, and also the castle, and we, uh, here is a sample, and then it's a grid and anode. And again, it's a gas flow mode, and we inject the uh, lower pressure, 200 torr, uh, argon, 10 percent metal mixture gas, and uh, it makes background, but anyway, so we use that one is, and then it's, uh, this one is the shaping ring, and we have, the, again, the sample change mechanism, that's because it's, uh, we need to change, uh, we need to take the background data uh, to ch by changing the sample without changing the condition, so we have uh, some of the mechanism. And then, here is a picture, so you can see that's a gear system, and then it's a, this is the sample part. And then it's a, at this moment, we put the checking source to check the it's a, it's a performance of the detector. And then one of the change is here. You can see this is the anode plate. So we apply the segmented anode plate. That's because it's, uh, later I will explain why we need this structure. But anyway, so that's, uh, this one is the uh, same diameter to the sample. And then it's, uh, this one is uh, separate, electrically separate second uh, electrode we call the peripheral anode. And this one is a central anode. And then it's another anode around here. So what should we care is this effect. That's because the sample is here. And then, oh, I'm sorry, this one is some problem. That's maybe Black Peak. And this one is, I don't know, it's energy loss or something. And this is a phi or something like that. And it's, it's, uh, you can see, this one is the proton experiment case. But the neutron experiment case, the pro fragment produced in here, and then sometimes it's angled. And then the Normally, uh, by using the electric field, and then they observe the anode signal. So as you can see, that the signal uh, has the different black peak height. That's because the, we only measure the projection of this distribution. So we don't want to do that. 
uh, such effect. So uh, we divide the electrode and then check the, which electrode uh, it's, uh, has a signal. So the once the straight signal uh, fragment, that it only makes the, it's a central part, but it's an angled one. It's a, not only the central, also it's a peripheral one, so the two signal will be available. So we can discriminate the event by using the peripheral anode signal and then select the straight uh, fragment component. That's uh, some, of, some of the software coordination. Oops. To check the system, I put the check source in here and then take the data in here. So this is the check source data and uh, the source uh, emit uh, three different energy. It's not essential, but it's, uh, I used the three different alpha uh, emission mixed source. The 4.8 alpha and 5.5 and 5.8 MeV alpha. And then this one is the output of central electrode and this one is the output of peripheral anode electrode. So you can see uh, this distribution. That because if the alpha particle going straight, so there's no signal for peripheral anode, so we need to pick up this signal. And then that's a alpha particle, only the alpha particle going straight to the anode. And the angled case, so that some of the part of the charge is distributed to the, uh, the peripheral part, but total uh, charge is constant. That is the reason you can see it's a straight line. So how much advantage we can have is here. Uh, the, this is the energy spectrum. If we don't have any of the selection, so the black line is correspond to the, uh, the energy spectrum. That's because of the sum of the energy is missing, and then the energy spectrum is distorted. But we, if we set the gate of the peripheral zero, then that's a very sharp, the peaks we observe. That's, which means that we can successfully it's a discriminate the angled event. So how much effect is here? That's actual data. So the neutron, 65 MeV, uh, irradiate uh, the black curve counter with the sample of the gold and uh, the polyester film. So what we want to do is uh, we want to measure the fragment from carbon, fragment from this helium and the lithium and the beryllium and boron. These are all data. So which means uh, these data contain the angled fragment effect. So the resolution of black peak is very vast. But once we set or well, do the collimation, and then it's really clear distribution we have. Even in the beryllium that we observe, the beryllium seven and nine component on the boron and the carbon. So that case, uh, we can define the particle type by using the black carbon counting. But one of the difference is uh, difficulty is the Detection exchange, that's because, you see, here is the range. Okay, so go straight. So that's a uh, solid angle determined uh, to the, this direction, but it's, uh, the range is very short. So we can accept the angled one also. So it's a solid angle or detection efficiency depends on the their own range. So we need to correct the effect. So how do we do that is the, again, the alpha source we use, and then the artificially change the, its range by changing the gas pressure, and then check the counting rate. So the gas pressure reduce the alpha particle going to the, it's uh, near the grid. On that case, the detection excess is very low. And then it's a uh, gas pressure increase, the alpha particle range is shorter, so the much more, the much more coverage angle, uh, so that case, that's a uh, solid angle is very large. So we also do the simulation and then they take the uh, experimental data and check the kind of uh, the efficiency. 
So after that, uh, to obtain, uh, deduce the cross section, we use the, this three triangle data uh, for uh, according to their range. And the range is uh, determined from the, their energy. So the actually effective energy, uh, for example, so helium is 4 to 8 MeV, or lithium is uh, 8 to 16, and beryllium is uh, 8 to 22 or 24 and boron is a 10 to the 30 something. And uh, this is the energy range we can measure for primate. But anyway, it's a really, this one is a trick. And uh, we never have such kind of effect for proton experiment. Only for neutron experiment, we need to consider about that. So this one is the polypropylene plus uh, gold foil. That's a foreground to measure the carbon and this one is the gold foil only. This is the corresponding background. So the most of heavy we have <laughs> is a, the background, mainly from the gas, I think, and also that's a, some of the carbon and the boron component here. But still we have the difference so we can subtract the background effect by using this, this data. So this is the result. Uh, that's, uh, Black point corresponds to neutron data. The energy, the neutron data is a 65 MeV, and it's a zero degree. And the line is the fits calculation, and the zero, zero degree, 65 MeV. And the open circle corresponds to proton data. We took the proton data for 70 MeV and the 30 degree, and also the, we have the calculation of proton. So actually, uh, some cases we have the difference uh, between the proton and neutron, uh, both the experiment and calculation. That's because the target is carbon and then boron. So you know that the uh, population of the, and the charge is different, and also Q value also different. But uh, uh, it's, uh, lithium and beryllium is not so much. And then it's uh, both the calculation uh, they produce the experiment very well. We can successfully confirm uh, the both the neutron and proton uh, fragment production. So this is a summary. So the, I talk about the DDX measurement. It's a double differential cross-section measurement for the fragment production reaction using black cow counter. The both for the proton incident and the neutron incident. Uh, there is a several difficulty for neutron incident case, but uh, we can take the proton, clear proton data, and then evaluate the reaction model, and then apply for the application. So this is the final result slide. Just introduce the my institute. So that's uh, actually we, uh, the physics institute, we have the so many accelerators. That's a uh, Part of main job is uh, developing the accelerator, and the other is the nuclear and elemental physics uh, studies we do. So this is uh, just an example. That's, uh, that one is smaller than LHC, but bigger than it's a synchrotron facility. That's three kilometer as a circular tunnel installed uh, kind of accelerator, and we do the study. So the, my main job is the, my business, actually, not research, the business is the designed accelerator for sealing. So we do the several calculation, that's the sealing related calculation that determine the thickness of sealing, or it's how much activity we're gonna have, and then it's how much waste we're gonna have, that kind of calculation we do. So the main motivation of research is the data, the basic data for that kind of calculation. If we don't have any appropriate data, so we try to take the data by ourselves. Okay, that's all I have for today. Thank you.